and everybody, do you both? You both have books. Okay. Okay. So we're talking about Christian to the core. And it's kind of funny because, you know, I talked about apples this morning. And what do apples have? Core. They have cores. And there's seeds within the within the, the apple. And then if you turn to your like the very first page, huh? There's a picture of a tree. I this was not my original idea, guys. <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> Actually, I developed it when I was in college. I didn't develop it. Jesus did. But <laughs> I um I like it and I copied it and I think it's a great thing. So I just I'm gonna I want to start actually let's start out is everybody um with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here to learn more about you, more about who we are, more about what you want us to do, more about where you want us to be and how you want us to be there. Just help us be better. Lord, and just help us be able to leave this place and make a difference. And you're holy and you pray. Amen. Okay, so I just want to read, and I'm not going to read like the whole book to you, but just that, that first little paragraph there where it says welcome. I like it. It says, a God-shaped life is illustrated in the Bible as a flourishing tree planted by God through the work of his hands. Those who trust in God and make him their confidence can be like a tree planted by a stream of water whose leaves are always green and always bears fruit. When Jesus announced his ministry to a brokenhearted and enslaved world by reading from the scroll of Isaiah, he said he would not just heal people, but that he could transform them into oaks of righteousness. Um, Cindy says, um, wait a minute, try the new one I just sent you. <laughs> For some reason, the first link I sent for this one did not work. Um, and then Nancy and Dennis are running late. But I want to read that to you because it comes from Luke 4. And it's called Jesus Rejected at Nazareth. Isn't it funny how the hometown didn't accept the hometown kid? So I'm going to start Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. As was his custom, he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They said. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. <clears throat> and there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only man in the Syrian. All people, all people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town. Do you remember what they were doing at the beginning of that I read? <coughs> what were they doing? <coughs> 
They were praising him. Kind of sound like when he went into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But by the time he got fed them talking, <coughs> they were furious. They drove him out of town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way because he was Jesus. But that scripture he talks about, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Isaiah 61 is where it talks about oaks of righteousness. Oaks of righteousness. And, um, you know, going on, when you become a follower of Christ, the seed of discipleship is planted in your life. God's desire is that, is that you develop deep roots and experience his full power and presence. So Christian to the core is going to be a 12-session journey. I'm going to just try this. I don't know. I'm going to have a hard time just like sitting and no, I can't do it. <laughs> yes, <that> little kid. <laughs> I need a bigger chair. I need a stool. <laughs> um, Christian to the course, 12, 12 sessions. So we're going to meet every, uh, okay, Cindy got on. We're going to meet um, every Sunday from now until December 15th. And if you aren't able to make it, it will be on Zoom. <clears throat> and I believe it is recording. <laughs> Same thing we had this morning. We had this issue in second service. Yeah. Um, but it's it's to become a deeper disciple by doing this, increasing your intimacy with God, increasing your love for the people that we all need that, and discovering God's greater purposes for your life. So just as a tree grows from the core, you also have the ability to grow when you focus on the core of who you are and what you can become in Christ. So that's kind of the welcome. And every week when we come in, there's there's a, in the very front, you know, this is the table of contents. Where did it go? Who gets next? Oh, it's a few pages past. Okay. There's a table of contents, which kind of shows session one, session two, session three. So the best thing you guys can do no, 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 yes. Okay, okay. Um, so this week, we're going to talk about session one. Next week, we're going to talk about session two. It's not what a, what a concept. We're not going to skip like before. But what I'd like you to do is kind of read through session two before we come back. There's no homework. There's no more you have to do your early, I promise. Just, just read through it. Maybe get an idea of what you want to say or what you're thinking. Tonight's is really kind of an overview of the core values. So we're going to go over every one and each one in a little bit. But each week after this, we're going to dive deep into them. Some of them, as you will see, we spend two weeks on. So... Um, so just make sure you do that. We are going to, um, I think everybody knows everybody here, right? 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 Do we all know each other? Raise your hand if you don't know the person sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's what I do. Mike is like, I don't know who's sitting here. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I just laid right here all day. Me? Yeah. I'm Carrie Byerly. I'm sorry. Carrie Byerly. Okay. Mike Wonder. Okay. And back there. Oh, I'm Rachel Flatter. Rachel. Okay. Rachel, this is you can say your name. <laughs> <laughs> this is Freya. <laughs> Freya. <laughs> Actually, I thought about doing the fun little activity. Have you ever done the thing where you have to go around and then I thought, you know, we're we're adults here, but Look at Sherry. She's like, no, please don't let me do this. <laughs> Where you go around and you find, you, you meet someone new, you talk to them, and you find out the favorite flavor of ice cream. And then I have you introduce that person. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been to Emmaus? That's a big a Emmaus. Yeah, it's always kind of fun because you find people that like the same ice cream that you do. And that's kind of cool. 
Yeah. Like, I don't know about you, but my favorite is a mint chocolate chip. Does anybody <laughs> else like mint chocolate chip? Okay. Anybody else over here? Oh, gosh. Okay. I'm the only one in my family that likes it. Everybody else thinks it tastes like toothpaste. <laughs> so I think it tastes really yummy. So I like my mint chocolate chip. So some of you might like chocolate. Do you know? Okay. So we went on vacation just in August. And we went to this, this place called Killens, and they make the world's best ice cream ever. And they had a sign with their top sellers. What do you think was number one? Vanilla. 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 It was vanilla. Vanilla. I know. Vanilla. <laughs> but it's just vanilla. <laughs> He's vanilla. Yeah. So is my my oldest son is vanilla. So you're vanilla. Any toppings? Usually not. No, no toppings. Yeah. You know, I have, yeah. you put enough toppings on it. True. <laughs> 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 I'm really the rainbow shirt right now because I feel that I feel like that's healthy because it's raspberry, orange, and lime. Those are all. <laughs> so. I feel like I'm getting, but we're getting off topic. So we are not going to go around and introduce ourselves like that and just, uh, this, unless you want to and talk about what kind of ice cream we like best. But this night may not go as long as the other nights, like I said, because this is an introduction. But um, before we do get started, um, we're supposed to start with an opening, a warm up question so that we can uh, apply this. I'm not making this up, but it says if you really want to know me, you need to know the length about me. So, since there's not many of us in here, and hopefully the ones online can come in, but let's, um, let's think about it for about 30 seconds. Think about what you would answer that question. If you really want to know me, you need to know what? Okay. If you really want to know me, you need to know that I mistakenly overbooked myself and I'm a horrible procrastinator and forgetful. So it's a really bad combination. <laughs> <laughs> A horrible hard to deal with sometimes. <laughs> oh, say, say all three of them again. A horrible procrastinator. Horrible procrastinator. I tend to overbook myself. Over or try to do too many things. And I'm really forgetful. That's me. I feel I feel you. I feel like, yeah. I feel any who who wants to go next? Hey Dennis. You really want to know me Oh, you're a tinkerer. Tinkerers are nice to have around. Ready, Alan? You want to go? Oh, that's <laughs> I think we already knew that. <laughs> she did. <laughs> She's being honest. Who wants to go next? Y'all are going to go. So, I mean, if you really want to know me, I am, I was the oldest. I'm a mother, a wife in the army, and a nurse. Ooh. Got any questions? <laughs> Your grandmother. Your grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's just start with Rachel. <laughs> If you really want to know me, you know I don't want to go first. <laughs> um, if you really want to know me, uh, I'm a mama of three amazing kids. Four. Four, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, and, um, have you ever seen me on Sunday uh, morning in the pew? I, I can't sit still. I'm always moving around and rocking. And... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Julie. 
If you really want to know me, you should know that I do not like to lead. I'm a really good follower <laughs> and a doer. I'll do whatever you tell me to do, but I don't like to lead. Okay. Okay. Sherry. <laughs> we just really want to know. You'll know that I have a tendency to feed every critter that shows at the door <laughs> to the delight of my neighbors. <laughs> yes. Even though we're in town, we have awesome number of critters. <laughs> and I had a coat wandering down. Oh, the yes, it's in the end. I mean, <laughs> I thought this is a big dog, but it was not a big dog. It was a gun. And the problem with that is, is that she called the Humane Society rather than her friend Jenny. So I think we'll think she won. No, I won't. <laughs> <Yeah, I'm sorry. laughs> but she did. I thought that was fun. Randall. Yeah, if you really want to know me, you have to ask the boy. <laughs> <laughs> As I saw these spouses over here, I thought we ought to have the spouse of each one. Huh. Okay, that's a great one. Right? If you really want to know me, I'm kind of a brat. Yeah, that's so, really? I know, yeah. Well, that's because that's because my next oldest sibling is 14 years older than me. So oh. <laughs> only child, only boy. Oh, oh. I'm only child. Oh, only yeah. cousin. Child at that time. I just said that. It's only he ever raised like in the home. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. I got loud. Yeah, you were, you were really okay. Okay. Just um, do you really want to know me? I'm an overthinker and overplanner. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love how the husbands are. Right. <laughs> hey, Mike. Having grown up in the country, I, I guess I learned all the things. So I'm always trying to fix them. Sometimes. It's a child's knowing I should let somebody else do it. Ah. So what kind of things do you are your favorite to fix? They think it's broken in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I do let them go pretty well. Only if not learn is do the back off and start. <laughs> Call the professionals. <laughs> okay, April. If you really want to know me, you need to know blank about me. What do we need to know? You really want to know me? I have a huge heart and love to fish. Can you do that? <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Nancy, you really want to know me? I'm usually too patient, too too busy, impatient, and fidgety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some of those fruits of the spirit, and I have part time patience. I was like, <laughs> like I was driving here, and I got behind someone who. Forty down alto, and I'm like, <laughs> so so good. I don't really need patience right now. <laughs> yeah, now I'm like right now I'm, I'm really 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 impatient. <laughs> you know, Jesus didn't have cars. He didn't get stuck behind slow people. Maybe slow camels are dumb. Okay, online friends, Jenny Martin. If you really want to know me, I thought that I was going to sneak by, Jenny. Way to go. <laughs> um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, gosh, I'm sitting here trying to think if you really want to know me. Um, I think you would know. I think you would know I love um, my family and books. Those are my two biggest loves. So <laughs> obviously Jesus, okay, but I'm talking about on this on this earth. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You know the book part about you. So I think you did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Cindy Lovegrove, are you there? I'm here. Hey. I think <laughs> you my me? granddaughter. <laughs> um, I think if you want to know me, you uh, know I have a dozen grandkids Jeez. and three beautiful daughters and an amazing husband. Yes, you do. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I guess it's me. Okay. So if you really want to know me, you need to know 
that I have a hard time doing nothing. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. That's kind of why I can't just like sit up here. So, and when he, Rachel, when you were talking about like I sit there when the songs are going, I'm rocking. Is yeah. anybody else rocking when the songs are? <laughs> yeah, it's like this thing I have to do. So it doesn't matter what it is, I have to do it. So, um, so the main point of this first session, the reason why we did kind of that warm up question is so that we can get to know one another. Okay, we we want to get to know the other trees in our orchard, right? Using still that same um, that same thing. So there's eight core values. These eight core values that we're going to go over. Um, so what I want you to do is turn to page. Turn to page fourteen. In your book. So now, this we're not going to do out loud. This I just want you to um, either write down, think about, maybe you can tell your neighbor. But those first three questions here, you know, what are your expectations of this class? What is it going to do for you? So I want to learn more about. I want to learn how to move, and I want my spiritual life to be different. Uh, Anybody get that? Does anybody want to share what their expectations are? And don't say because Pastor Sam may make you do it. <laughs> Cindy, by the way, Cindy Lovegrove, do you have a book? I do. Okay. And I know Jenny does. Okay. <laughs> does anyone want to share? Well, my audio is already on, so I might as well. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to learn more about leading a godly life. I want to learn how to lose myself, my flesh. And I want to I want my spiritual life to be different by drawing closer to the Lord. Does anybody else want to share? Okay. I want to learn more about the Bible and how it relates to me today, more modern terms. And I'm going to learn how to be a better disciple to others. And I want, I want my spiritual life to be different by growing my relationship with God. Good. 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 Anyone else? Good. I wanted to learn more about intimacy and passion, like my personal relationship with God. Um, I want to learn how to evangelize. I think I know how to evangelize, but I want to know how to do it well. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I want my spiritual life to be different by living my Christianity more consistently every day. Okay. We're actually going to, I think it's after week six. Yeah, week six is the power of your story. And then for the following sessions after that, we kind of build on that. So sharing your story, evangel being away, like your elevator story, being a way to evangelize. Anyone else? Okay. Well, um, so talking about introducing these eight core values, and what does the word core mean to you when applied to your life? Deeply ingrained beliefs. Deeply ingrained beliefs. Mm -hmm. 
What drives you? What drives you? The base where you build everything else up on the required. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, when I used to teach a pregnancy exercise class, and of course, your core is changing <laughs> for the nine months, you know, <laughs> and to, to get into your core, you're, and then you, you won't be moved. And so, we used to talk about that core. So, I get into the core so much with Jesus that I'm going to be immovable when trials and tribulations and crises come, um, because it's not if, it's when. And by the way, we won't be strengthening that core here. <laughs> Even though I could use that. So, who else? What does core mean to you? In the apple example, where are the seeds? In core. In core. I've always kind of thought of the core as the center. Right before I throw it in the trash after I eat it, guys. So, okay. But still, it's the center, the center of your of your being. And and that's why they say when you strengthen your core physically, that it strengthens everything. So it's amazing. Um, so introduction to the eight core values. We've got intimacy, passion, vision, evangelism, multiplication, family, stewardship and integrity. So we're going to look just briefly at each one of these. And as I mentioned, um, they go way deeper when we when we start looking at each one of these separately each week. So our first one is intimacy with God. God looks for consecrated men and women who live life from an intimate relation ship with God and biblical foundation is Exodus 13 9 and 11. Does anyone want to read that? It's right here, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, that as Moses went into Yes, sorry. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of the cloud would come down and stay at the entrance. While the Lord spoke with Moses, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with a friend. So the world needs people who are deep in their spiritual lives. True intimacy with God occurs through intentional effort over a long period of time. Visual relationship grows deeper. So when we're talking about intimacy, some, sometimes people think it's weird that you can have intimacy with God or intimacy with Jesus because they think of intimacy being something that should be loved in your bedroom. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that deep, deep relationship, that deep love. So what one thing could you do today to develop greater intimacy with God? Like a friend, like a counselor. I think just inviting them within to like every aspect of it, in in prayer and conversation, and like the smallest thing happening in your day to. And, and if you want to, you can just jot it down there. If you don't want to say anything out loud, you can just jot it down. Um, because at the end of tonight, we're going to do a little, it's not a quiz. <laughs> That's not the word I want to use because it's not a quiz. It's, it's kind of a ranking of statements to see how you feel tonight. And then we'll do it again at the end of the 12 weeks to see how you feel about each of these areas then. So if you do write down 
how do you feel? You know, this is like brand new. We're just coming in this. So how do you feel? How, what can you do today to develop greater intimacy with God? So if you want to just write it down, that is perfect. Now, in, in what Nancy read there in Exodus, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with a friend. Can you imagine? So the next thing we're going to look at is passion for the harvest. So God wills for men and women who share a passion for those without Christ. In Luke 19, 10, Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost. God desires that everyone be reached with the life transforming power of the gospel. Passion for the harvest. So our biblical foundation is Matthew 9, and it's right under there in italics. Does anyone want to read that? Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless by sheep without shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, A harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers in his harvest field. Hmm. And then you go on to read two thirds of the world's population has not yet responded to God's love. Until all are reached with the gospel, every Christian is challenged to accept the awesome opportunity to share the good news with others. Do you guys know what the biggest mission field is right now? The biggest country mission field? United States of America. United States, absolutely. Can you believe that? 50 years ago, would we have said that? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Africa sends missionaries. South Korea sends missionaries. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. so, so the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. It's kind of like we talked about this morning with the, with the pray for me. Uh, they're there. Even, even each of those kids that came for VBS, they're there. They just need someone to reach out to them. That's all. There's plenty of people out there. So can you name someone in your life that needs to know God and his love? And would you commit to pray for this person for the next 30 days? So write in your book the name of someone or some people. Maybe they know God, but they're not intimate with God. Or maybe they, they know God, they know who he is, but they don't know really anything else about him. And would you pray for this person daily for the next 30 days? Um, so our next one is the power of vision. God looks for men and women who discover God's vision for their lives set goals, mobilize people, and overcome obstacles in order to see God's purposes achieved. And the biblical foundation, have a book too. Does anyone want to read that? Sure. Then the Lord answered me and said, record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run it. Okay, God created you to be a person of purpose. Vision is God's tool to help you discover God's greater purposes for your life. 
Vision will help you establish life priorities, motivate your commitment, fuel your passion, and help you focus to reach your full potential in Christ. What is one thing? Did we do it last year? We lost any more. Did we do it last year? Does anyone remember when we changed our vision and mission statement? Does anyone have it memorized? To be and make disciples. That's inspired by you. Anyone else? It's in the bulletin. It's in the bulletin. It's in the front of my notebook. You know, my uh, reach here and restore. Yeah. Yes. 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 Those two. Those two. Remember, I need the bulletin. Yes. <laughs> I don't even want to put it in together. <laughs> you know what? Like, what if we all memorize that? What if we all worked on memorizing that? You know, I was cleaning out. I was cleaning out my cupboard. You know, because our kids every time they see us, they go, "You're emptying the cupboard every every day, Mom, right?" Because they don't have to clean up when we die. <laughs> you would say how many times we change our vision. I think we need to talk about one that we have with Mike Dominic, but was just to love God. Love you. And, oh, you know, the sooner yeah. the better. Yeah. So, I mean, but hey, there's like four. I know. 40 you. years I've been here, we keep changing our vision. <laughs> oh, God. Let's so, I threw them away. No, currently. <laughs> it's not currently. You know, our vision changes. Our vision, the overall purpose doesn't change, does it? I mean, all in all, we love God, we love people. We make disciples. We are a disciple. All in all, that stays the same, right? But yeah, it seems like every time we get a new pad, this is the fourth one since I've been here. <laughs> or at least the third one. This is the third one. So, so I don't have it memorized either, guys. Maybe, maybe we need to work on that too. But uh, Sometimes when it's, when it's just written in easy places, like in the bulletin, you can just access it there. But you know, in order to truly live a vision, it needs to be on our hearts. It needs to be in our minds. Do you remember how the the Jewish, the Jewish, uh, what are they called? Shema? Phylactery? No, the phylactery, the one that they put on their head, yeah. And, and, you know, they would be, that would be right there. They wouldn't have any issue. <laughs> so, so just a reminder, you know, if we, if we don't know our vision, and we know our vision as Christians, we know our vision as far as what Jesus wants us to do. But as far as knowing our vision for the church, if we don't know that, then how, how can we do anything, really? Because everything should be a part of that vision. Every decision we make should relate to that vision, should have something to do with that vision. So, um, mm -hmm. you have it? Oh, yes, please read it. Our vision, not our mission, our vision, we will build relationships by connecting with the people of Kokomo, and beyond to share the truth of Jesus Christ so that he may restore lives throughout our community. Oh, that's hard. That's where the connect, share, restore comes in. Yeah. I said what you should say. Connect, share, restore. You know, if we can just remember that. Yeah. Connect, share, restore. I'll tell Sam, Jenny said we can just remember <laughs> <laughs> Connect. Share, restore. Um, yeah, I need I need like words to help me help me do that. So um, mm -hmm. tell me around what's the mission? The mission is is mission more of what to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ who want to passionately love extravagantly and witness slowly. Okay, okay, so. Connect, share, restore. Yep. So describe your best understanding of God's purpose or vision for your life. What would God, what would his purpose be for your life? Anyone? 
and you can't just put to make disciples. Because <laughs> that is our that is our first argument. Yeah, we need to go. Sorry. We'll be here next time. Okay. <laughs> I get this, uh, it's called Global Workers, and, and it's women who are missionaries, they changed the name, Global Workers, and this one just wrote, and I've been reading it, I've had it read it three times now, she, and, you know, all my life I thought I was supposed to um, bring others to Christ, and one day she read a simple Westminster catechism and instruct her, my neighbor is the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. This is the first and greatest thing. And so she said, the other is happen to be there, but that's what my job is. Mm -hmm. I love the Lord. And if we do that, everything else falls in place. And just like our vision here at the church can change, our vision personally can change. You know, I mean, overall, if you were going to think of a God's purpose for your life, I remember. When I was 23, I was, I guess Sam talked about this too. He had a really bad car wreck when he was in his early 20s. Well, I did too. And I should have died in it. And everyone kept telling me, God must have a purpose for you. That was the worst thing they could tell a young in the 20s person because I didn't know what God wanted for me. I wasn't even really with God at that time. And putting that on me, it's like, now I felt like I'm disappointing him. But I didn't know him. I didn't know him. But now I know God's purpose. Or maybe I don't. I still may have something coming down the line. I don't know. So let's look next at culturally relevant evangelism. God looks for men and women who live and share the good news of Jesus Christ with cultural relevance, sensitivity, and power so that the eternal truth of the gospel will be understood and received in every culture of the world. And our biblical foundation is 1 Corinthians 9. Anyone want to read that? <clears throat> now, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. To win as many as possible, I have become all things to all people, so that all possible things I might say to some. Okay. The life transforming power of the gospel must be communicated with cultural re relevance by word and deed and the power of the Holy Spirit. Cultural relevance, what does that mean? Definitely native language. I was going to start talking in old King James. People aren't going to If you go into a school with, with an old King James, yeah, you got to meet them on their level, on their ground, at home. Yes, yes, yeah. That doesn't mean we have to be worldly. It just means we need to understand them. And if we understand them, it shows them that we care. It shows them that we took the time to figure them out, to be more like them. We've created a relationship with them. So the, the gospel can go across any language. <laughs> it can apply to any culture. Um, and, you know, is this... Is this going to teach us how to specifically culturally evangelize? You know, everything changes every day. And, you know, we're in Kokomo. I think this was written in Chicago. So, you know, I, I everything, you know, it's it's such a different 
it's it's so different. So I'm sure that when we get to this, it's going to be um, just a way for us to be like Jesus, but just be more like him. So what are the best ways to share God's love with people in your environment? Meet them where they are. Meet them where they are. Smile, listen, and pray. Smile. Smile is a really good one. Yes. Listen. Listen is very important. It is very important. The number of people talk is listen. Give me the right as an example. Yes. Mm -hmm. And arrive as an example of Christ. Mm -hmm. So they can see that. Mm -hmm. We studied the realm of helping hurts, how to alleviate poverty without hurting yourself in the poor in our missions team. And one of the examples was this church went down to South America, they saw it, and they came and they built the house for the pastor because he was living in a hut. They come back the next year, the house has not been lived in. They didn't listen, and their culture, you don't go to the bathroom in your house. They had the bathroom right there in the, you know, basically the middle of the house. So it wasn't used. Nobody listened. That's not what that, that village needed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't want to go far away. There's a lot of the rooms where we interact with low-income houses here at Goldman. The person in charge basically said, these are some of the things you want to be careful of. These are some terms you may not be familiar with. So we didn't say or do the wrong thing. And I thought, this wasn't in another part of the country. This is right here in this, this community. Uh, and that was settled when I was open to me. So mm -hmm. definitely there were a couple of differences. Yeah. Um, and things that are common, like finding syringes in the <laughs> walkways and so forth, don't touch them coming. You know, you know, but it was, it was like a different world. And I thought, that's right here. And these were very poor and needy people, but the couple mission had a way of getting them to do this. So, so this is him during that experience. We, um, we go to Garden Square Apartments, which used to be Gateway Gardens, which is right by, I chose Cena. See, she's on. <laughs> um, which is which is right by Oklahoma Urban Outreach. Um, and we go and we do a back to school program. And, and a lot of these kids I've met through Narrow Gate, so I know these kids. And then I see their parents. And that's where I think, you know, it is important to reach kids. But if we don't get their parents to, they are lost. They are lost. And the only thing that they are finding is instant comfort. Instant, something that's instant. It is, and that is right here in Kokomo. I, I, I often think, you know, if, if you've ever seen our youth group, they're really great kids. I mean, they're they're great. They wear modest clothes and they they're they're just wonderful. And if they were to go there and see the way the parents dressed, I I don't know if the parents would want their kids seeing that. I know it shocked me, and I'm old. So we do have to be culturally relevant. That doesn't mean we dress like them, though. Just like when Cindy and the Light of the Darkness people went into, into strip clubs, they did. Yeah, they were not. <laughs> they were not doing that. When we're talking about meeting them where they are. <laughs> Cindy. I know. Yeah. No, I know. I know. It's it's when we're talking about meeting them. Look into their house. eyes, by the way. Huh? No, you look into their eyes. Not Nancy. Yeah. Will they look you back in the eye? Oh yeah. Will they? Okay. Okay. 
I, I wonder because sometimes that can be like an ashamed thing. So I can see maybe them not wanting to look you in the eye. Uh, how do you get on that committee? Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's like you raise a parking lot for us. Yes. <laughs> hey, you know what? How many, how many surf clubs in Coco are now Mexican restaurants? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I remember when we first went out, Patty asked, she says, what, how, how do we, and we're with two of these ladies, and she's like, what do we, I said, just have them and talk to them, yeah. and that's what we did, and we went from there. Mm -hmm. yep. You just, you just love them. You don't react. You make sure you have one of those faces that's not reacting, um, and, and you just want to make sure that you're doing research on it so that you are aware of it. No matter what culture it is. So culture, culture, culture is also a little different when you're dealing with the homeless. Ooh, very true. Because you know, I was I was working with Cam and you're dealing with totally, totally different, but it's still the same thing. The words you speak, you look them in the eye, you treat them like you would anybody else. And sometimes, you know, they give you a little bit of hard time. But then by the time you're you've been there a little while, they've got nicknames for you. And I've got one that calls me Cynthia. And you know, it's it's culture isn't always, you know, that type of thing. It's just the homeless and who they are. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cindy. That's very true. Well, one thing that I always, when I get into it, it, I always remember that for the grace of God, that could be me. One car accident, one some, something, that could be me. Whether it's homeless, whether it's mentally incapable, whether it's whatever, that could be me. And just for the grace of God, it's not. And then you know, it's that's all I want you to remember because it could be me. It very well could be you. Very true. Very true. So moving on to multiplication of disciples. God looks for men and women who disciple, coach, and mentor others who in turn become effective disciple makers. And our biblical foundation is 2 Timothy 2. Anyone want to read that for us? I can. Okay. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will call, who will also be qualified to teach others. Okay. So God's main strategy to reach the world with the gospel is through the multiplication of faithful disciples of Christ. Every Christian has a responsibility to multiply, multiply the impact of the gospel in the lives of others by making disciples of Jesus. We're not supposed to just come in and sit in our pews. That's not what we're supposed to do. So who is discipling you to follow Jesus? And how can you help disciple someone to follow Jesus? My Bible study group. That's My Bible study group. Oh, okay. Okay. Who else? Anybody else? Who's discipling you? Other Christian friends. Other we, Christian friends. So we support each other mm -hmm. in a need when that one needs whatever. That kind of changes through your life. Like my youth group leader was hugely important in discipling me as a teenager. Now in the church, you know, we have you, we have Sam, you know, there's there's lots of good mentors in this building. 
but but yeah, I agree with Nancy. Other other questions and comments are extremely helpful. Have you ever heard? Have you ever heard this saying? If going to church makes you a Christian, then going to the garage makes you a car. <laughs> and this is usually spoken by, have you ever heard that? Yeah. You've never heard that? Okay. I, I, yeah. That is usually spoken by people who don't want to get up on Sunday mornings and go to church. Um, but what? We can be Christians sitting at home. But we are way better off when we're around the community. And Jesus wants us to be in community. I mean, I don't know about you, but my bestest friends are here at this church. The people I see all the time are here at this church. Hey, Jenny, on the flip side of that, a car that's kept in the garage is in a lot better shape <laughs> and runs a whole heck of a lot better. And a Christian that goes to church is a better Christian. That is true. Unless it sits in rocks and rusts. Well, that's right. <laughs> maybe, the, maybe the tires, you, probably, you know, the car, you know, you know, you know, so it just sits in the... <laughs> I don't know. I used to have to, um, I used to have to say it to someone <laughs> in my family, um, and, and it would, my, my argument was just, just go to church and see. Just go, because it's, it's not. That doesn't, and it's funny because once they start coming, then they get hooked and then they want to keep coming. And when you miss church, it's like you've missed your home. So we want to invite other people into our home. We love lots of friends. And that's what we're going to learn when we talk about the multiplication of disciples. So next, we're going to look at family priority. God looks for men and women who are convinced that the family of God's building block for society and make their family a priority in their lives. And the biblical foundation is Genesis 1. Anyone want to read that? Genesis 1, 1 through 3. I will. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Okay. Be fruitful. Sound a little familiar? God ordained the family and provides guidelines for developing healthy, strong families. Family is the first place that you should extend your love and influence. Isn't it funny how sometimes family is the last? Because you don't want to offend someone, you don't want to make someone not like you anymore. So what are the greatest opportunities and challenges facing your family right now? Time. Time. Yeah, time. With small with you know they're not small small kids anymore but they're in elementary and middle school sports and trying to take the time even to still have a supper at the table like tonight it didn't happen we try our best at least at least five times a week to sit together and eat supper tv off mm -hmm. and the more stuff they get into the harder that is mm -hmm. that is very true and there are so many distractions, so many distractions. Even if you don't, you know, a lot of you don't have kids at home. The wow. influence of unchristian people in their lives. Yes. We are fighting against the world for our kids, for our grandkids, for our friends, for our families. We're fighting against the world. And the world right now is winning. The world, the flesh, and the death. Yes. So, swap to the wrong one. So, um, if you were looking at like opportunities for how you could you could develop, you know, develop your family. And, and we're thinking here in a sense of 
of all kinds of families, whether it's husband and wife, whether it's um, a family with kids. We're going to look at that. So, um, whether it's a family of God, because we're a family. What opportunities do we have? What challenges do we have as a church? I think what she pointed out this morning is a big east in the churches. And I, I told her a class this morning, I said, you know, it's been proven that churches are dying down from old age. Mm -hmm. The age group every year, the average is increasing, which tells us that we're not keeping our young people in here. If we continue on that path, somebody's going to ask, well, the last person not turn the lights off. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to take a place if we don't keep kids here. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. That's a sad, that's a sad thing, but that's the truth. And it's happening all over the place. Churches are closing. Which leads to the next one, <laughs> faithful stewardship, <laughs> which definitely helps us stay open, but it sure does a deep deeps in the seeds. Um, so faithful stewardship. God looks for men and women who are faithful stewards of finances, time, and spiritual gifts in their personal lives and in their service to God and others. The biblical foundation is Matthew 25, 23. Anyone want to read that? I can do it. Okay. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So every follower of Christ is responsible for using God's gifts to achieve maximum impact for the kingdom of God. When I go to heaven, I want Jesus to say that to me. But sometimes I don't think I can live up to it. So how are you using your finances time? Because it's not only money. Time is so important. Spiritual gifts are so important to bring the kingdom of God on earth. I know there's several people in here. I think everyone I'm looking at gives and gives of their time and their gifts. The ones online give and give. <coughs> Is there anything you would do differently? <coughs> I know I need to do this differently. So something I'm intentional, I, I know I need to work on before January 1st is being <laughs> more intentional about planning ahead what I'm doing, especially with the church council. Like they, they decided I needed to be in charge of <laughs> I'm, I'm scared to death. And I know that I need to work do better about planning ahead and be, you know, be thinking about meetings two or three weeks before they even happen. So that's something I need to get better at. I have to say no. One of my spiritual gifts is organization. You know, like when I fill out the thing. But unfortunately, it takes time to be organized. <laughs> and that, <I'm> <laughs> Just go look in the resource room. No, don't go look in the resource room. <laughs> if any of you have the spiritual gift of organization, and I know a couple who do. <laughs> She's ignoring me right now. But um, our last one we're looking at <laughs> is integrity. 
God looks for men and women of integrity who live holy lives that are accountable to God and to the body of Christ. Integrity glorifies God, protects us from stumbling, and encourages growth. And our biblical foundation is 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I was hoping Cindy would read that. <laughs> God desires that all Christians maintain integrity and finish well in their lives. Integrity provides moral authority for our lives. So how do you live your daily life with integrity? Well, I know for me, I just keep saying, hey, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> On the outside influences slave. Yes. They're all out there every day. Mm -hmm. If anything, you know, stay steadfast and they're gonna change. Yeah. And I've had co-workers <clears throat> change what they're how would they were gonna say something and I use swear words because they're around me. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I leave, they change, but you know, <laughs> fuck around. Yeah. But that's showing respect. And that's one thing. People don't have a lot of right now. Respect mm -hmm. for others, respect for people in authority. How else can you? A, a part of integrity is to be authentic, mm -hmm. but a, authentic as a Christian. Yes, yeah. I have a friend that I, I want to be like her when I grow up. Um, and she she and she would argue with me if I told her that, but she is the type of person that is always uplifting every single thing she says. And it's not annoying uplifting. It's just just to make you feel. And it's like I wish. I could be that. I wish I could do that better. <coughs> so we'll look at that. So um, the eight core values are like a bookshelf with the books listed in a special order. And then the two bookends are intimacy with God and integrity, our I words. In between are the other six core values. But each is critically important that we balance all of them within our lives. This, this has to do with all of them. Um, and it doesn't say that we're going to not have any challenges. It doesn't say that. But he's never going to leave us, is he? So... Um, This application, this living Christian to the core is the next part. And I, all builders know that a strong foundation is essential for every building project. That is so true, right? Any weak area will eventually compromise other parts of the building. But when the foundation is strong, the building will endure for generations. So these eight core values are going to create a foundation for having a meaningful and purposeful life. Is it going to fix everything? Is it going to give us all the answers? It's not, but it sure is going to help. Um, each one on their own, integrity, intimacy, passion for the harvest, evangelism, they're all important. They're all important. But when we do all of it together, way better it's way stronger that foundation is way stronger so what i want you to do now is down under the workshop <clears throat> it says rank the statements below from one which is strongly disagree to five which is strongly agree you're not going to share this this is just for you and when we come back at the end of our 12 weeks you will do this again and 
Hopefully we've all done better. Anybody get that? If if you haven't, you can continue finishing. But I wanted to sh share with you. Um, I don't have it as a graphic that I can share. I have it on my computer. But um, back in the welcome where it has a little tree on it, it talks about a study that George Barna did, and it's talking about ten stages, ten stops along the Christian journey, and his his the their studies have shown that um, there are 10 stages and only one in 20, which is 5%, move past stage six, which is spirit, spiritual discontentment. So say, stage one is ignorance of sin. And so so kind of as, as we're going through this, I want you to kind of think what stage you would consider yourself. Okay? So we have ignorance of sin. And then we have aware of, but indifferent to sin. So number one, you're just living the high life. You're just doing whatever. Number two, you know it's wrong. We don't care. Number three, concerned about implications of sin. Okay, this is the person that's feeling, feeling guilty. Number four is confession of sin, salvation. Just, just great, but we're only in four. Number five is faith activities and works. And right here is where 89% of Christians stop. They do that sin thing. They confess their sin. They might do a little bit of faith activities. They might do a little bit of good works. But it's just like the garden. If no one is tending it, they can't keep going. So number six, five was faith activities and works. Six was spiritual discontentment. Seven is personal brokenness. Eight is submit fully to God. Nine is profound love and intimacy with God. And 10 is profound love for humanity. So you don't have to raise your hand, but if you were past seven, if you were submitted fully to God and had a profound love and intimacy with God, you are like 5%. Of Christians, of people, of Christians, that of, along the Christian journey. And as Cindy said earlier, Matthew 22, 37 to 38, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. See, we have a mission visit, a mission statement, and we have a vision statement. That I can't remember now. Read. Connect, share, restore. 
um, <clears throat> CSR. That's how I'm going to remember. But if we just remember and live the words of Matthew 20, 22 here, we're, we're going to be great. Everything will be rosy. Everything will be coming up. Everything will be perfect. No. Well, we target on our back for saying <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people are just darn hard to love. Um, it's kind of like the kid, like like the person you're trying to disciple, and they roll their eyes. Has that ever happened to you? Mm. Mm. And you're supposed to go back again and again. And again. And one time, something will set it. It may not be you that sets it. It may be someone else. But the problem is going back. We have to go back. <laughs> Even after we're turned away, made fun of, ridiculed, had their, had their eyes rolled. That's, that's, that's really... Uh, that, that annoys me. <laughs> so Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So let's go ahead. Does anyone have any questions about tonight? Remember tonight is just really an overview of what we're going to do. And then next week, we're going to really dive deep into the intimacy with God. Does anyone have any comments about tonight? Any comments about um, disciple making? The best part about being in a group is being able to hear and to be able to share our ideas, each other's, each other's thoughts, things that we've all been through. Because we learn from that. So does anyone have any thoughts or Pastor Sam about the our whole leadership group before a year of them should be through this because if we can't do what's in this book, then we're not really effective leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's exactly, that's exactly true. All the church council, all the staff is to go through this over the next year. Because yeah, we can't, we can't disciple others if we aren't taking care of ourselves and we aren't being with them all the time. And developing these core values. Anything else? So a number of years ago, waiting to come to our church and just turn on the television. You know, there was a young pastor who's on there telling about his first day on the job. And it stuck with me because of they have been 20 years old, and they came in and they said, My wife's got a new car, and my kids are on the bus. Can you help me, Pastor? And what he said to him, he said, First of all, we got to find out what your relationship is with God. And we talked about her. That's first. He said, and, and he used the cross as an example. He said, That vertical connection with God, if that's not in place, you can't reach out. And that was the horizontal. He said, You'll never be able to help your family or anyone else unless you. Or yourself, you have that 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 well in hand if you have a relationship with God. So I think that's that's why I think that's why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Is that if we don't have as leaders a relationship with God that is is as real as we can make it, how are we going to be able to lead others? Mm -hmm. and, and I so I think Sam's exactly right. Uh, so make it easy <laughs> because nobody likes to sell their school, but uh, if you do this, share with each other. So it's not homework, though. <laughs> well, that is good. Except you need to kind of at least glance at next week's before next week. But. 
So I, I think we need to do it. Uh, I think we work better and we're getting it possible. And and if you think uh, Mike, you Mike's one that's on the discipleship team uh, with me. If anybody would like to be on the discipleship team, discipleship team, please let me know. Like have you. But he's on it with me. And you said a word the other day that is stuck with me, and it was tap root. And when we're talking about this tree, this discipleship tree, this oak of righteousness. If it doesn't have a root that's going down deep, what's going to happen? It could have tons of branches up here, tons, tons of them. But what's going to happen when the first big wind comes? Yep. So we have to be fully grounded. We have to have that deep conversation or that deep intimacy, that deep relationship. Because we could just keep making branches, but it's not going to do any good if we're not. If we don't have that tap root. What was it you said? Oak trees have like a really extra deep. I picked a tree I was going to ask the, well, somebody named know Mark Miller. He was my landscaper. And I said, Mark, a little tree. It wasn't that far from the house. I knew it was going to grow. I said, I want to make sure. What's the strongest tree? And he said, oh, because it has a tap root. A lot of trees have roots that go out, but oak has, <clears throat> has a root that goes deep into the ground. And, and so I think the use of, of an oak tree uh, as an example, this is really a good analogy in terms of where <laughs> as Christians. Uh, so uh, I, I, think, I think about the market. Mark is going to be and some of you don't work. Well, I mean, Technically, I mean, well, Jesus referenced it, but Isaiah talked about being oaks of righteousness. Um, so, anything else? Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, as we explore these eight core values, Draw us into a deeper relationship with you. Help, help us to get a bigger, better relationship with each other because we need each other. We need this community. But we know that you have great purposes for our lives. You know exactly your plan for us. And we want to make sure that we continue to grow and spread our branches, but also continue to just drive down into the ground as we develop a deeper, deeper relationship with you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.